Hi, it's day 36 of the Vendée Globe, and over the weekend, the repairs to Sam Davis and Mocha Initiatives Cur were complete, and after some sea trials, she's hoping to depart Cape Town in the next few days. With the back markers now past Cape of Good Hope, Sam will be hoping to get underway as soon as possible to limit the distance that she is behind the fleet. Of course, there's the fleet being her safety net. Um, I'm joined today by Mike to, to chat about the race, uh, so let's uh, quickly bring him in. Hey, Mike. Hi, comrade. How are you doing? You look a little bit out of focus yeah. there. I'm not sure. Quite Very good. I'm is. not sure what I've done to get out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it coming? Maybe it's yeah. an auto focus. Maybe better. I need to. Is that better? There that's, you go. That's there got you. it. Okay. So there's been lots of comments about the differences between the, the new foilers, um, the older generation non foiling boats, you know. Are they as as competitive? Uh, and interestingly, uh, if you sort of compare the last generation boats and and in fact the race four years ago, uh, which saw very different conditions both in the Atlantic and I think in the Southern Ocean, you know there are some um, some interesting differences to talk about. What what do you yeah. what do you think uh, between let's take the foiling boats of this current generation? And perhaps Alex and um, and Armel's boats in four years ago. Do you think you know yeah. they've they've made big ground? You know, great great sort of improvements. Well, on performance basis, you'd have to say no. Um, you know, I think they've had a rather unusual set of conditions in the south, uh, and even in the Atlantic, they weren't they didn't have the beneficial conditions that they had in the last edition of the race. They were extremely quick right out the blocks from from the race last time round. This time they had several challenges to overcome, several big weather systems to contend with, and they never quite. We never saw any of those twenty four hour runs that we've seen in we saw in the last edition, for yep. instance. Yep. So the boats haven't really let rip, even though kind of we know that if they were given that opportunity, they'd be breaking twenty four hour records and. We, we're kind of expecting that, but as the race moves on, it gets less and less likely because the boats get more and more broken and uh, the chances of doing that diminish. Interestingly, uh, Bauer <laughs> Becking uh, made the comment over the weekend that um, he's been uh, routing a Volvo 65 and he, he yeah. fully crewed Volvo 65 sailing at you know full performance and he was saying that they're comfortably ahead at this stage of the race yeah that doesn't surprise me i mean you know in reality these are solo boats and uh, the volvo 65 is a very quick boat um <clears throat> you know it hasn't kind of um but then again there's a big difference between routing and actually being there you know the routing on the on the wing conditions and not the sea state is very limited in its uh potential and what has been holding these boats back has been sea state almost certainly yeah um and you know it's it's all very well they've got these extremely fast boats but they're not allowed to let rip because they can never let rip without fearing uh you know a big crash so they have to have the right conditions uh, we've seen little glimpses of it but it's never really got going and uh i think because the ice gate moves ever further north it makes getting those kind of long flowing waves <clears throat> where you might be able to foil successfully in the south um, is less and less likely because the ice gate is shoved ever, ever further north and you're sailing in less and less of the traditional southern ocean conditions that we yeah. come to realize. But it, it does make you think that a, a, a new 21, you know, 2020 version of a of a low rider could actually be a quicker boat on the Vendée Globe course to this point um, than than a foiling version. Yeah, you know? I and mean, it's really interesting. We're, we're all obviously playing the the virtual game, and I I'm not entirely sure you know where the, the the polars you know come from, but you know just what you were saying. You know we're you know we're sort of where the last generation boats were you know four years ago. Um, uh, and and conditions have been you know far far from optimal this time round. So let's have a quick look at the, uh, the the current situation. The low pressures seem to be pretty much 
tracking along south of the ice limits and this big uh, dominant high yeah. pressure in the Indian Ocean. Um, you know, do, can you remember in the four races that you've done, you know, there being a sort of similar weather conditions as this? Well, I think in all the races, including 2012, which you just referred to, the the ice limit was quite considerably further south. So, um, but, you know, is it different? It's easy to say it is. I, I, I don't know. I don't know is the honest truth. Without having a proper analysis of year-on-year uh, -year weather, I, I'm not sure. But uh, I don't recall the boats sort of stumbling forward quite as for quite as long as the boats seem to be stumbling forward yeah they're doing good speeds but they're good speeds they're not great speeds you know you're seeing 18 19 knot averages whereas in 2012 we were seeing 22 23 knot averages so yeah. with with non-foiling boats I, I should add um so you know clearly there's a big difference between the two weather cycles but um where the class goes now will be very telling and you know it does seem to me that the boats from the last edition were potentially better compromises and i'll use that word advisedly better compromises than the newer generation more foiling optimized boats uh, which seem to suffer on the other hand these boats are going to be rocket ships in the atlantic on the ruder arm and the transaction club which are another important part of the mocha circuit yeah um these boats are going to be monstrously quick and they will break records so you know <clears throat> when you build a mocha boat you build it for the vendee and but you also build it to take part in the other races that keep the circuit alive in the in between years let's have a quick look mm. at the uh the weather forecast over the next couple of days so that that's you know the current midday today this 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 high pressure it's a little bit like the uh the high pressure around cape town just sort of s seems to follow the fleet round and as it loops uh, across and i think we may see a big gap opening up between the first three boats who just hang into this um pressure system and then the the, the boats behind just getting trapped by this this high high pressure system uh, i think by by wednesday we may see 5 6 700 mile distance between these uh these two groups for sure yeah yeah it's it's a difficult set of weather they're kind of pinned aren't they they're pinned against the line <laughs> they're, 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 that's right i know nowhere yeah. really to go what what yeah. what what about armel tripon's uh but he's obviously made you know some good ground in the last last week um you know, yeah he could make a big catch up here you uh, know it, look, it certainly looks that way do you think his boat's a bit more sort of optimised for the south compared to, you know, the, the front boat. It's difficult to know because Armel had the foils that were not dissimilar from the Hugo Boss type foils, which should give him a boat with very good downwind speed. So, but I think, as is the case with all these boats, the difficulty is it might have the capability of very high, good downwind performances, but can you deploy it in the sea state? And I think one of the problems about being further north you just have to look at the weather chart you've got up now you can see the slice of ocean that they're sailing across is full of you know potentially quite confused um quite confused seas and you can imagine if they were you know i don't know 600 miles further south i know that's a lot but if they were 600 miles further south and you run a line across that weather chart you've got almost a continuous flow of oscillating westerly so yeah. the, consequently the sea state 600 miles further south will be much longer much more uh much, you know much longer much easier um, pattern to sail within and you know this is the compromise you know it's not a compromise i mean it makes sense to keep the boats away from the ice i, I completely get it i i'm not a fan of the line i always like the gates but Hey, you know, it's a choice. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I yeah, certainly my recollection from the Indian and the Pacific Ocean was that you would sort of, you know, you'd set up on a on a on a northwesterly, and then you'd be on a southwesterly, and then you'd be on a northwesterly, yeah. and then you'd be on a southwesterly, and you know, it'd be sort of you'd 
it would get very cold on the southwesterly. The northwesterly yeah. would get really foggy. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, but 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 in the main, you know, you were sort of never less than twenty plus knots, and no. and just you know feeling it. And and these conditions, yeah. you know, very very different from the Southern Ocean. You know, you, you you and I probably experienced. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. And you know, that's what the boats have got to contend with. And perhaps the lighter conditions on the face of it might appear better conditions for deploying the foils but actually the sea state just isn't and i think that's what they're having to contend with and the the breakages we've seen the big breakages and i'm thinking of alex's boat and plb i mean they're the same failures they're basically the bow of the boat breaking off from presumably from pitching the boat into you know from trying to push pitching the boat into waves and coming to a horrible stop uh, and the bow of the boat's been ripped upwards by the rig and the buoyancy of the of forward part of the hull in front of the mast bulkhead. And the, the two damages, and we've seen it before in the class, you know, it's an area not of weakness. I think that would be unfair to say that, but it's an area where you're trying to minimise the amount of structure because you're trying to keep the boat light, and it's you're always playing a dangerous game. And some of the loads that the boats experience are, are clearly outside of the loads that you're seeing on the modeling, you know. Um, yeah. And as a consequence, the boats are breaking. And, you know, it can fix those things. These things can be fixed, but um, for the next edition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good point to, to state, say that these boats are also, you know, built for a circuit and the circuit involves a you know a whole myriad of Number different of conditions so i mean you have to remember that a mocker is a, a skipper-led democracy class so when it gets to the end of the von der globe it's at that point that they all sit down as a group of skippers and and vote on the changes that will stand for the next four year cycle this system has worked extremely well for the class and the question remains as to what big changes will they make? I mean, obviously, they will, you, there's only so many things you can mandate against. But one of the things that has been discussed is the inclusion of uh, T-foils on the rudder. Well, you know, T-foils on the rudder will make the boat more controllable, but it might actually make that accidents, the crashes, the things that have broken bows off uh, even worse, even harder. And if you don't have a T4 electronically controlled, um, it's probably more prone to accident. And if you do have it electronically controlled, it's going, to, it's going to be prohibitively expensive. So I think on balance, they'll probably say, look, we've gone a long way. We're learning. Let's keep going the direction we're going. They have to protect the boats and the sponsors that have made huge huge investments in the class yep. and i think that's right and so you don't want to sit suddenly go backwards and remove the foils they might choose it might be a good choice to limit the length of the foil uh, mm -hmm. and to have some absolute limit on the foil to minimize the amount of writing moment they can create uh, and you know that might be a sensible way of stopping the boats growing foils because effectively an amoka is a an unevolved uh, multi old it's an unevolved trimaran yeah and if yeah. you don't watch out those foils are going to get bigger and bigger and uh, yeah. it's just all going to get a bit out of hand so that was mike golding it was great to get his thoughts on the foilers v low riders and the challenges the amoka class faces going forward we're back on wednesday when all eyes will be on samantha davis as she hopes to set sail from cape town and rejoin this great adventure See you then.